Now we begin our fourth and last panel discussion for Africa Tech Week, and I'm sure that you will agree it's probably one of the most important panels to have. Um, and I've got an amazing panel that is going to be really grappling with a number of issues. We know that we are in a male-dominated space, but it's wonderful when we get a chance not only to celebrate women in tech, the waves that they've made as trailblazers across the African continent, but also we want to really delve into some of the challenges. So welcome uh, to our panel, Yandisa Sokanyile, who's the Chief Digital Officer at Connector, as well as Andrea Claire Proctor, the CEO and co-founder of Digs Connect, Caitlin uh, Dalcart, who's the co-founder of Flair in Kenya, and Dr. Diana Wangari Getau, who's the principal and founding member of Lens Africa in Kenya. We have so much to discuss, so welcome and thank you for making the time. Uh, starting with things like the impact of your own career journeys and what that has felt like. We're going to go to gender parity. We're going to go to looking at the tech industry and its transformation. So there's a lot. We have to really be concise and, and really hit all those points. But let me ask you first, starting off with you, Yandisa, what for you is your burning platform that drives you every day um, to, to really help to transform this industry? Good afternoon, um, Zanele. Thank you so much for having me here and good afternoon to everyone on this platform. It's, it's really great that we're having this conversation and it's an all women panel and I'm very excited about that. It's about time. You, you really have this moment where you have an all female partner in, in, in the tech industry. So well done on that one. Well, for me, the, the, the bearing passion um, and regarding the, the the gender issue in the in the tech industry is one of the critical things that are really that we battle with actually as women in the industry is just bringing more women um in and just not women and if you look at women in marginalized communities in rural areas and townships um the the gap is even wider there so my passion and every platform that I use is to actually advocate for those women, especially the ones in the marginalized communities, to actually be brought forward because there's less information about the tech industry, still very seen as a male-dominated um, industry, and women, especially in those areas, are not even um, are considering it. So my, my platforms that I actually use is to bring them in. I also do um, a 4IR feature uh, in Venec where I unpack 4IR in Corsa and in the most simplest terms so that we can have the rural communities um, and also not make language a barrier for people to, to partake in the fourth industrial revolution. So that is just my banning passion and I use every platform um, to actually bring, especially the radio, that's the platform that I really use to actually encourage more people to come on board, especially marginalized communities. Talent is immense there. People are, are, are taking the smallest things that they have and making something. And I'm thinking if they've got access to internet, they've got access to knowledge and opportunities, imagine what um, they can do. Because you find the rural communities actually are, are surviving on, on, on the smallest thing and they are inventing for survival. You know, if you don't have something, they put things together. Now, just a little bit of a platform, a little bit of encouragement and a direction, um, they can do amazing things. Thank you so much, Yandisa. We'll definitely pick up on some of those going forward. Alexandria, over to you. So, I mean, there's so much that really drives me in the space. But I think the main thing is just that, you know, as we've seen with women in politics over the, the course of the last eight months, I mean, 2020 has been crazy, and female leaders have just led so well. So I think there's this idea that's quite pervasive in society that, you know, like giving women leadership or women, women getting leadership positions it's sort of like, you know, do women a favor, but it's not that. Women perform like better, I would say, than men in leadership positions. We need to have, in my opinion, every industry, you know, and every company run by women. Uh, if you look at, you know, the countries right now that are run by women, it's New Zealand, if it's Scandinavian countries, Singapore, Germany, they did fantastically. You know, the results just show that. And so for young girls who are going to get into tech and then looking at, you know, leadership in companies, leadership in tech, and if they're just seeing men, I think you kind of, it can be quite just disparaging when you can't kind of re recognize yourself in those positions. So really, really saying that, you know, women leading these industries, like 
just perform phenomenally. So not just for the sake of, you know, for, for the women themselves, but for like your entire society, your entire community, your entire country in the world. Um, honestly, women lead better. So for the sake of progress of humanity, I mean, that's what gets me so excited, is that it's not just a thing of saying, oh, let's play catch up. It's let's be phenomenal. And I think having women in those roles makes us phenomenal. I love it. Thank you, Alexandria. Um, I, I think it's about really allowing women to be in those leadership positions so other women feel that they can also be part of the game and part of, you know, um, the future as well. So it's really an interesting thought. I'm going to come back to you with some tough questions on that. Um, let's move on to Caitlin. Clayton, what is your, Caitlin, what is your burning platform? Thank you so much for having me. And I couldn't agree with the other panelists uh, more. I think for me, you know, early on in my career, it was very much about putting your head down and just executing, performing, working. And I think as I've transitioned, you know, into a founder and into a leader, it is exactly that, is opening doors for others and realizing that while the company um, needs to succeed and we will make sure that it su succeeds in Kenya and beyond, it is also making sure that you're lifting women up. Um, behind you as well and creating an example. I think that's the hardest thing uh, for myself is that when we raise money from investment funds or when we look for board members, it's oftentimes not you know a female that is the candidate that's out in front. Um, so also being that example for other women, I think is incredibly important to show that it can work, does work, and uh, we are phenomenal. So the lack of transformation has reasons. Obviously, we not women are not being allowed to participate equally or effectively. We are going to talk about some of those barriers because of what I think is important is for us to recognize that even though, as you said, it's important to arrive and to be there, but there are reasons why we're not getting there and there are reasons why we're not staying in those leadership positions. So talk really needs to be broken down into where's, where's the problem? You know, where is the actual problem? And the problem could be... Could could exist in the most interesting places. So let's not go there yet. Um, over to you, Dr. Diana Wangari. If I can't hear you, then I don't think anyone else can. Um, there you go. Yes. Excellent. <laughs> um, I, I agree with the uh, members of the panel as well that um, I think some of the challenges that to experience as women in tech goes beyond just creating seats at the table. It's also support in terms of capital. So in terms of my platform is, how am I able to support female entrepreneurs to access this capital? Because I think entrepreneurship has become more of a generational calling, especially with the population boom that you're experiencing in sub-Saharan Africa. And so then in that case, with this brilliant uh, talent that Yandisa spoke to, that they get to a platform whereby, yes, they're pitching for their ideas, but on the other end, who's actually pitching for them? Who's helping them access that capital? And I think at some point it becomes that it is a boys club, not just from an entrepreneur perspective, but from an investor perspective. And and we have, if we have voices on both sides of the table, both sides of the discussion, I think um, that gives a better fighting chance, right? And so it's really providing support on both the buy and sell side of uh, the discussion as well. What's so important, is, I love your statement, is that it's everybody's battle to actually get this right. It's not just the battle of women to actually get this right. So how are we going to, and I hope that, that we, we obviously have men and women listening to this panel, we really have to give people and arm them with great knowledge that they can use, one, for the reasons to allow and enable transformation and how to play their part. I think we're so caught up in our worlds, what we're trying to achieve for ourselves, that not everybody really wants to get on this bandwagon of let's bring more women into the industry. I think people are more caught up on you just, you know, for their, their own growth and development. So let's really give people some nice nuggets. Caitlin, I'm going to come back to you. What do you think is one of the main reasons why women are not allowed to participate effectively and, and, and equally? And what can be done about it? What is the mindset we have to request people to have um, in order to make a difference here? That's such a good question and such a hard one. I mean, I think it is actively being on your toes and not just letting things kind of brush over your shoulders as well, in the sense that you're not trying to create a fight every single time something comes up that is not, you know, in the support of women. 
But as an example, you know, if you're in an investor meeting and someone says something to you that's not correct or, you know, you know is biased, you know, through gender is actually calling it out and just being like, hey, that's, that's not a fair comment to say. And I think that I personally am getting better at that because I think you're so nervous to call something out on that. But I think really until we actually are more assertive, and that's not all of it. I think that's part of it is just making sure that we represent ourselves and also um, do demand kind of that equality and fairness um, in those conversations, 100%. Um, I think on the kind of a, more of a corporate or venture side, um, it is making sure that there is full diversity and representation. Until there is a diverse um, set of decision makers, there will not be diverse portfolios. Um, and so I think it's on them to have, you know, at first there are rules of equity. Equity does not equal equality, but making sure that there is at least a woman in the decision-making um, seat, that there are, you know, different backgrounds, different uh, races, that it is fully diverse as it relates to decision making 100%. And that needs to be just a policy across the board. Otherwise, uh, we can't all as entrepreneurs be incredibly blazing and, and so sort of so many decisions and things to think about every single day. But I do think those are two very kind of quick things that could be done. I love it. First one is be aware of bias. And the, being aware of bias is not just when you're listening to other people having bias, but you could be the one that actually has to be aware of your own bias when you are listening to women uh, presenting you know, their business cases or their ideas. And the other one is have women in the decision-making panel. You know, Diversity is not going to take place if, if women are not there to, to actually enable and help other women to get on top there. I can see that you're thinking, Alexandria, what's on your mind? <laughs> That triggered so many thoughts. I mean, I've been going through this journey myself of what it takes to be a strong woman. Because, you know, we kind of always sort of swear it out, and I would definitely consider myself quite a radical feminist, actually. But what is it to be a strong woman? And, you know, for most, I would quite, uh, my mother is like a strong woman. She's a feminist. And so you inherit these ideas around what is a strong woman. And for most of my life, I felt that to be strong as a woman meant you had to emulate masculinity in how you spoke, in how you made decisions, and even in how I dressed. It's like you have to dress quite, you know, in a certain way. And what I've begun to realize the last few months, that is completely backwards. You know, like, you, you to be a strong woman is to be like, find your power in, in the root of your femininity and to let that come out. So that's been so interesting, talking about those unconscious biases, because I think that's so true. I think that, you know, if you sit in front of a, a, of a VC board and you're pitching, uh, what's interesting is that I think men will recognize qualities in men. They'll be like, oh, that's a strong quality. That's an investable quality. And then women will have different qualities that have made them fantastic leaders, as we've seen in, you know, female leaders in countries right now who are doing so well. But men will necessarily recognize that, uh, quite strong qualities in a woman. And so that's, yeah, I think that's why we need to have, you know, women in those positions so they can recognize those qualities and be like, actually, it's not about doing anyone a favor, giving them a leg up. It's about meritocracy. It's about the results. It's about showing this actually is, like when I started saying, it shows that it actually adds uh, to the bottom line at the end of the day. You know, what is, what are you trying to achieve as a company? It's obviously, it's growth, it's traction, it's revenue. And how an approach, a feminine approach, actually shows that there's returns on that. I mean, I was reading the other day, which is so interesting, that because you kind of only are aware of your perspective, and uh, you kind of overlook things that are quite, that are even quite obvious. For example, like the childcare industry, is somewhat overlooked by the VC community. It's a massive industry and there's so much money to be made and there's so much disruption we can have there. But I feel like because men are traditionally out of childcare, they're kind of just looking over this. And as more and more women are starting companies and you know, you become venture capitalists and, and unlocking finance, they're realizing, you know, what the only thing that a venture capitalist should be realizing is that there's money to be made here, there's value to be unlocked here. And by backing women, they can then do that. So the bias isn't just, you know, for the sake of, you know, it make people feel better. The bias is for the, like, you know, what's getting in the way of is that it actually is stopping growth. It actually is getting in the way of value. It actually is getting in the way of like revenue. So to get down to like the brass tax of it, you know, I think by, by, by finding strength of femininity and by having that kind of lead us, it is just literally, it's, 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 cre it's creating industries and creating value and unlocking that in a way that if we try to just, you know, emulate masculinity only at men at the table, we just are blinkered to so many opportunities. Mm -hmm. 
Blinkered to so many, blinkered to so many opportunities. I love that. A panel member yesterday said, we, only, we fund in our likeness. Now this is an, further prejudice to people of different color, people of different language, people of different ways of communicating where they don't have uh, English as their first language. Um, do you find, Yandisa, that this is what you are trying to change? Um, because you're going out there, you're trying to educate communities on tech and tech opportunities and, and, and being part of incubators that are enabling them, but they won't be heard because they sound different, they look different, they don't, there aren't people who are funding people who look like them. Do you find that this is a challenge? It's a, it's a big challenge. Um, firstly, as you say, that the language also. So here in South Africa, you find that if you go to the Eastern Cape, maybe, or the other communities, go to rural communities, people are speaking their mother tongues, 100%. So when they have to pitch to uh, VCs or to incubation companies or any pitching, that even they're not even exposed to that. Not that they don't know the business or the solution that they want to pitch. It's just they're not comfortable speaking in a different language because this, they speak their own mother, I mean, mother tongue on a daily basis. So that's one of the things. Then it, it, it just sort of suppresses their self-confidence as well because you find the other guys pitching and then you start judging yourself. I think this is a subconscious thing that actually, that actually happens. And also because the information is not really available in different languages, you know, so some, some people might just not be fluent in English and um, a lot of opportunities might actually miss them. Hence, I start to unpack and put it in the simplest terms. And that's another thing with the, with the tech um, space. There's so much of coding. Everything is in terms. It's, it's AI, it's ML, it's IoT, it's all of this. And we talk like it's normal. You know, but when you want to introduce and bring people in, you can't start talking in those terms. You talk in the language that people will understand and people will relate to. So that's one of the things that I'm trying to do. And at Connector, what we do also is um, connectivity. We provide free Wi-Fi. We do um, internet connections at Texas ranks and the churches because we, we get to understand where you're going to find a lot of people, the communities. How do we turn the churches into centers where people can go and connect? You know, so this is where you start. And without the connectivity, that's what we believe. It's a base of everything. Before you go for the industrial revolution, streaming and everything, a person sitting there without the connection, they don't have the means of sitting and watching a an event for five hours, you know, per se. So those are the things that we're trying to address, just the basis of that, to say, where do we start the people so that we can bring them along, you know, as we, as, as we grow along. So we identified the challenges and also, if you look at the, the women, this is like a historical and a very structural um, transition that we still have to be going through in, in different industries. It's like mining, um, you know, um, tech is the same, where it, it used to be a male-dominated industry. But the way that we should be doing it is... I've got a girl, you know, you start with your own children, you know, bringing them in into the space so that we the start seeing the mother being um, in this business, you bring them in so that it changes the mindset and they can actually know that these are the opportunities that are there. And also when this is something that I really practice, whenever we get an opportunity and um, often a, a, a job or a, a tender or any work that we need to do, always have a pool of women-owned companies. I've got my squad of women that know if we get a job, they are being subcontracted for something, you know. So that's how you actually bring in more, more, more women into the space so that we move ourselves from ourselves and always looking and say, I am chasing my own goals. That is how we're going to grow. And it starts with us, women in the tech space. So don't be comfortable and be content that you're the only woman in that boardroom or you're the only woman in that seat. So start saying, I have a team of other women, you know, that I can bring in where there's an opportunity, be able to, to refer another woman if they, even if they're not there. So that's how we actually going to grow. And then the more men see women, the easier it's going to become. And when we get there, I always say, once you get to the boardroom, gender does not matter. So it, it mustn't be that, you know, sometimes you have our own bias as well. When you get to the boardroom, it doesn't matter if there's 12 men and you're the only woman, you know. I've had instances where men will start looking like, yeah, I just thought you were just a pretty face. 
I'm like, I, I got used to it. And I'm saying until they stop doing that, because we need to see more women coming in. And by doing that, you bring in more women yourself and say, here's my team. Here's my um, other partners that I'm bringing along in this journey. And that I think for me personally, that's how we're going to move the message and not just talk it. We need to act it. And it's so true. I think we are in that era where women can and want to and will bring on more women. I don't think it was the case many years ago. We were just waiting to be let in ourselves. And it's also even ridiculous that we have to use the word let in. Um, and once you're even in, the struggle is to hold on, you know, and, and not be shown the other side of the door. So whilst you've made it through exit, it's now about how do I stay inside and not shown how to, to, to get out of the game. Um, and, and I think prejudice is, is the the biggest problem that we have. You know, prejudice, it's not just South Africa. It's a global issue when we are prejudiced against other people and we have an exclusionary way of thinking. You know, uh, probably for me, as big a problem as what global warming is, but that's a conversation for another day. Uh, I want to have, I want to move on to uh, Dr. Diana Wangari. Your own story as to why you even went on this journey was because you felt it firsthand, how difficult it was to be heard as a woman. Over to you. Uh, absolutely. I mean, um, my background is actually a medical doctor, so tech was completely a new field. And I ventured into health tech just to provide access to healthcare services. And I do remember, just as Yandisa mentioned, that uh, there are all these new terms you're struggling with. You know, you're not from that background. It's this boys club that you're trying to fit in. And at some point, I got to realize, wait a minute, I don't have to fit in, you know. Um, I am me. I'm trying to solve a certain problem. I know what my vision and my purpose is. I'm going to stand for my own sort of um, purpose, right? And I became sort of more conscious, not just of the bias, but I became aware of the self-doubt that was growing in me and was impacting sort of some of the results that I was, I was meant to deliver, right? And at one point, I realized, you know what? I'm going to just go ahead, be different, but I'm more importantly going to ask, right? If I don't know something, I'm going to go ahead and ask, right? What's the worst thing they're going to do? Say no, am I going to die? No, absolutely not. Um, and that led to solve this path whereby I sought out opportunities by just asking. Sometimes there's no girl's code baby you can turn to, right? And just because those seats are so few, right? You have to go ahead and seek out these opportunities, seek out even if it's advisors, mentors, right? And through that, I found, you know, um, raising sort of fundraising for my business became just that more critical because I was able to reach out and say, okay, I'm struggling with this. I'm struggling with this, right? And it's been through that journey that I've said, okay, fine. I've been successful to this point. I'm going to go back to the community and say, you know what? The same struggles I had, I'm here. Ask me whatever question it is. And that has sort of become my mission, right? Go ahead ask me what you want to ask, right? And if more people were willing to embrace that, you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to have all the answers. The opportunities do not sort of present themselves on a silver platter, right? You have to seek them out. I think it's that important to just ask. And to have that open mind um, and not go in necessarily with, you know, with the issues on your shoulders, Go in and say, I'm here, I've arrived. You know, ask me, what is it that you need me to do? And But this is what I'm here and, and this is what I'm about. Caitlin, how are you keeping yourself resiliently in the fight all the time? Because I, I can definitely confess there are times where I wish I could, you know, just not be in the fight, but I don't have the option. Let me just wait and see. Is that... We, we, we've, got a, we've got a theme song. You know, we always got to have a theme song. Somebody's got a theme song in the background. Just let me know how we can switch that off. Maybe it's just me. But Caitlin, maybe let's move through to you and all of us can mute. Can you hear me? Yes, can hear you perfectly. Did you hear my question? Okay. Did you get me? Yes, the, qu the question was about how do I stay in the fight? Was that correct? Yes. Yeah. So I think there's there's two things. One, which was um, you know was the formation of our company. So I run a company called Flare. We do emergency response. Uh, was having a co-founder, and she's also female. And so 
we are each other's kind of right hand person in the sense that we really provide that support, that kind of um, uh, also that, you know, when we exit a meeting together and we say, oh, did that feel off? What was what was your impression? And really having that co-captain. I think it's incredibly lonely being an entrepreneur and then being a female entrepreneur. I can't imagine doing it alone. So I think that's one thing that I've done is made sure that we kind of are a team and we're and we're a support to to one another. Um, I think the second is just being so resolute and determined on what we are building, and we know that it works and it succeeds. And uh, in, despite, and I'm going to say this out loud because you know sometimes it's so easy to believe it when people say no, they don't want to invest in a, in your company, thinking that it must be you know a reflection of yourself. Um, and realizing that it's not and and just constantly getting yourself out there every single day and staying energized based on the product and the service that you're delivering um, and, you know, continue to be determined um, in that. But I really think that the first and foremost is having partners with you um, that really understand you, see you, support you such that you don't have to kind of do it yourself, um, but you have, have someone lifting you up and supporting you along the way as well. I think that's been my lesson for this week and, and, and the last week, have a co-captain. Not easy to find one. Um, and sometimes we get burnt once or twice and then we vow never ever to have another, another one. Um, but I'll move through to you, Alexandra. What is keeping you resolute and focused on your own mission? Um, yeah, that is that's actually quite a profound question. Um, you know, I think it goes... I think it goes quite, you know, quite, quite deep into, into kind of what motivates you in your life. You know, I think for all of us in this panel, um, we're very uh, workaholics, <laughs> you know, love what we do, um, very passionate, very driven, very ambitious, um, very set on doing something, you know, like making a difference in the world. And so it really think, drives onto the core, what drives you, you know, as a human being. And I mean, just the knowledge that the other panelists are sharing right now is really so profound. I mean, I love what Diana said about the authenticity. You know, this is me. I'm doing it my way. And I love that because the world doesn't need copies. You know, the world needs fresh ideas. And talking about a co-founder also. I mean, but I think, you know, to kind of, to get to my answer about what drives me, I think, I think part of it's in my nature. You know, you sort of, if you look back, everything kind of makes sense. You know, they say the revenue is always clear in the windscreen. You look back and you see how it all makes sense how I got to this point. But I think my nature, I, I'm i quite a, I don't say, a little bit of a troublemaker. <laughs> I look at any situation and be like, you know, how can I get involved? I'm very opinionated. I'm very loud. <laughs> um, I'm very assertive. And I look at any situation and, you know, as all South Africans, we find problems in everything. We're like, that's not good enough. That's not good enough. That's not good enough. But I love being getting involved, talking about the solutions, being like, okay, cool. This could be better. This is how we're going to do it. And then really like, you know, having the courage and conviction and backing yourself and saying that, and I've got the solution to do that. I don't need to, you know, deflect to authority. I definitely need to like, you know, defer to a male authority figure. I've got the solution to actually um, to propose how we can fix that. And so I think this nature of mine, that kind of just led me to kind of constantly like being involved in everything, things happening in the world, being plugged in, being involved, having conversations, asking questions. I love asking questions. And I mean, I was at a, was at a panel on um, Tuesday with some other local tech CEOs and I was asking all the questions and some were like super simple. And I think some of the people, they were getting embarrassed for me because I was asking questions that everyone's like, how can you not know that? But I mean, how many people didn't know and they didn't ask, now they'll never know. So I love asking questions. So getting stuck in, really getting to the root of it and then kind of having, how do I say, almost the audacity to say that actually I have got the solution for this and I, I'm going to do it, you know, I'm going to keep going. And the whole thing with, um, like Katie said earlier, which I loved about like, don't take a person who says no. I mean, as women, we eat no for breakfast. We get no morning, noon and night. And every time I said, I actually love it. Cause I'm like, good. I can't wait to show you, prove you wrong. Cause I'm going to do it anyways. I'm going to do it amazingly. And I actually don't need your help to do it. So you can either be involved in the solution or just like watch it happening. <laughs> so I think what drove me was just the idea of that I actually don't need to have permission. Like the world is, the future is nothing more than what we decide it's going to be. We decide what we want to build and we just have to build it. We have to decide where do I want my country to be in five years time? Where do I want the world to be in 10 years time? That is literally just a matter of us deciding today, let's do it. Now this is probably when's the best time to plant a tree 10 years ago. The second best time is right now. So deciding what we want, you know, our society to be and the biggest issues we're facing, if it's climate change, if it's GBV, if it's unemployment, if it's, um, you know, the host of issues, 
what moves you as a human being? What can you feel like within your sphere of passion, within your sphere of the skills you have? Everyone has things that they're, just, you know, they're naturally quite good at. Like, what do you want to the world to look like in 10 years' time? And using, you know, your passions, your skills, uh, your net, whatever you have, how can you start getting there? I think so many, like, entrepreneurs uh, kind of want to change the world and give themselves, like, a month to do it. They're like, I'm going to do it next week. I'm like, <laughs> no. You it's okay. Let, let, me, let me jump in. <laughs> let me jump in. I think I think what you are doing is you're responding to one main thing is how do we get more women to get involved? I love what you've said. Be resolute. Decide that you want to do it. Be in there. No excuses. No permission. And that was going to be my question actually is what is it, what can we do to make more women get involved in this space? And, you know, you've answered it just by being that role model. And I, and I hope that, you know, that's what people learn from you. Do you think, um, and I'm asking um, Yandisa, Yandisa, based on just Alexandra's real passionate wanting to get involved. Do you think it's important for women to hold a technical degree? And do you also think that even women who do hold the qualifications or those who don't, are women being fairly compensated? And how, how can we close that gap in terms of what they're bringing to the party and what they're getting? Is there a gap you believe? Yes, um, there's still a huge gap in terms of the, of the income gap. Um, that is still there. It's a fight that um, we still have to fight. But in terms of qualifications, what I like about tech is that it offers it an opportunity for you to do any other course. And if you find out you can do just online courses and you specialize um, in, in any sector or any division, and you become a specialist in that, and it doesn't really necessarily need you to have a degree. And I always say, when we employ people, we're not necessarily looking for, for, for degrees. You rather have a person with the technical skills or coding language or um, an OEM certification that you're going to require for that um, specific field. So it has changed things that we, the landscape now, you no longer have to actually have a, a university degree for you to be recognizable. Your experience also is very important. So you rather have a person with uh, practical experience also as well. And the good thing about the opportunity it presents in the in the startup economy or um, the, the, the business economy is that at least people now can actually come together. This is where it enables collaboration, where people with the ideas, people with the accounting skills can actually come together to form a startup where you bring the different skill set and start working together so that the industry can grow as well. So some people are not even technical. And when I started, though I did um, information systems, but I spent most of my time in marketing and communications, um, that's the skill that I bring in. Um, and then I have technical partners and um, a technical team, which is tech, who do not talk consumer behavior or go to market strategy. That is my part. They bring in that part. So we've got that collaboration. So I think, um, you know, it, it's, it needs everyone. It's an opportunity for everyone. Um, you can from different industries, but you meet with a technical person and you do that collaboration and you can be able to actually form a startup and the the, the opportunity is there for for startups for smmes to 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 come in and you know with the education system i've always said god we need to change the education system i'm i'm i've never been happy now because i can go to work come back at night and still do my courses short courses online um that's that's a huge opportunity and that is what is really required um right now and I really think technology is, 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 is a game changer. And the more people that we actually bring in to embrace it and, and you know, start using the, the tools and giving them an opportunity, this is where we're going to see, you know, greatest innovations coming. And I always say also the, the greatest inventions of our time will probably come from rural communities also. So without the rural community, you know, because that is an opportunity I see because from me, I come up from a rural community, you know, and I always look at myself and say, you know, there's more me sitting there who are looking for an opportunity. You know, um, I look at God's grace to say I've been able to be afforded the opportunities that I currently have. I'm able to be able to sit in those seats that I, I'm, I'm able to sit in. But there's more of, of people there that are looking for that opportunity and that can contribute so much towards um, innovation, that can contribute so much, you know. So that's why my passion and my vision and my mission is to ensure that I bring a lot of other women or people in the rural communities, give them the opportunity so that they can also partake in the space.
I loved it. Thank you so much, Yandisa. And I'm going to ask you, Dr. Diana Wangai, to close off for us. And I think for me, what's really key is, and to close off as a statement and anything else you want to say is, do you think that women's ability to get funding and the kind of funding that they get is because of the biases that women are actually, um, you know, having to deal with? Is being a woman impacting what you get and how much you get. That's that's a better way to put it. <sighs> Tough one. <laughs> <laughs> um, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and uh, it, 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 it's literally personal experience, right? That, um, you know, you, you go out there, and I believe most of the panelists would agree with us, that the fact that again there aren't too many people seated at the table who are who have that experience or who are able to look at sort of um, the business practices from a certain lens and the gender lens at that and there's no diversity at that table really does impact the kind of funding that uh, most businesses get receive right and i think that all sort of speaks to sort of the societal change that we're trying to bring about to such discussions, right? Because at the end of the day, if we don't have more women speaking out, if we don't have more stories out there, more voices, right, telling our narratives, saying this is what we're experiencing on the ground, right? I went and pitched, and this is the feedback I got, right? If we are not able to call out the biases we are seeing, right? Then how do we make a difference, right? So does it impact? Absolutely. And what is the solution? It's us putting ourselves out there and saying, you know what? This is what we're experiencing, we're experiencing and it has to change and it has to change now. And we're not asking you for that permission. We're going to take it, right? And if not, it's not even about getting a seat at the table, right? If we have to, we'll have to create our own table if it need be, right? So <laughs> at the end of the day, I think if more voices, if more people are saying, you know what, are speaking out, this is what I've experienced, I think that just calls for more a collective voice and just that greater an impact. <sighs> Well, we've said what we can say. Um, we probably have not said it all, but you know, take it or leave it, right? This is it, start somewhere and help us please to change the world by removing prejudice and exclusionary thinking um, to create this better world. I wanna say thank you so much to all of you, Yandisa, Alexandra, Caitlin, and Dr. Diana Wangari. Your comments and your contributions were unbelievable. We'll be back in a minute.